All right. Lovely. Uh, Jimmy, I'm so excited to be here with you today uh, to talk about our sort of shared mission of preserving humanity's most important information. Um, and so I'd really just love to start there. Um, obviously, um, what you've done for preserving information is, is in some ways unparalleled. And I'd love to hear from you about what inspired you to do that and why that's such a hard problem to solve. Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the inspiration for Wikipedia really comes from uh, you know, some of the core ideas of uh, free software, open source software. Um, you know, the vision for Wikipedia is for all of us to imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. Uh, but I wanted to, to do that, you know, when I, free, I mean, f you know, free is in speech, not free is in beer. So um, all of the, the standard tenets of free licensing and so forth. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, kind of obviously a hard problem. Uh, and certainly, um, as we see today in the world, we see this incredible decline in the quality of the information ecosystem, uh, decline in people's trust, uh, because there's all kinds of uh, fake news and low quality news outlets. There's social media where people spread rumors and falsehoods sort of rampantly. Um, and yet at Wikipedia, we, you know, we've kind of dealt with all of those things and we're not perfect, uh, but the core concepts and the core values of Wikipedia to try to get it right um, have always been there for us. But obviously the whole system, the governance model, the decentralization aspects, all of it comes into play in terms of how Wikipedia works and how it doesn't sometimes. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I know that in the beginning, um, it, I've heard it say said about Wikipedia that it's a good thing that it works in practice because it would never work in theory. And I know that you yourself were, were even early on skeptical about, about whether this model would work. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that skepticism and, and what led you to really use this um, community-driven model um, that really is not something that you would necessarily think might be a slam dunk? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you didn't attribute that. It works in practice, uh, but not in theory to me, because I never said that, but it's been attributed to me at times. Um, I, I think if you've got something that doesn't work in theory, but does work in practice, then something is deeply wrong with your theory. Uh, theories do need to map to reality. Um, sorry, I just went on a little rant there. Uh, what was the second half of what you had said? Uh, Basically, you know, what is it that made you uh, come to ah. this model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely in the early days. So before Wikipedia um, had a project called Newpedia, which was very top down, seven stage review process to get anything published, uh, very centralized. Uh, and it didn't work. Uh, first of all, it wasn't fun for the volunteers. So I knew it wasn't going to work when I sat down to try to write uh, an, an entry. And I, it was hugely intimidating because they were going to take my draft and send it to the most prestigious finance professors they could find. It was on financial theory. And, um, you know, I was like, this isn't fun. Nobody's going to want to do this. Um, and so I drew inspiration actually from uh, Friedrich Hayek, uh, 1945 uh, essay in American Economic Review called The Use of Knowledge in Society, where he talks about how a price system distributes decision-making out to the endpoint. So at that time in economics, there was this huge debate about whether a centrally planned economy could be more efficient than a market price-based economy. And he argued that it can't because it's more expensive and more difficult to communicate all the information to a central decision-maker rather than pushing the decision-making out into the endpoints. And I think that's the insight really of Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia is not a market system, it's not a price model, but that decentralization piece where we say, oh, actually, we don't have this all-knowing board of directors uh, editorial uh, at, the, at the top. Uh, what we have is thoughtful, kind, rules-based debate around every entry in Wikipedia where people who are interested can come and chew on the facts and discuss and debate and try to improve it uh, over time. So it's, it is quite a different model, um, but it actually works pretty well. And what do you think it is that makes it work? Well, I mean, I think uh, a lot of it is uh, the, the values of Wikipedia, the assume good faith. The idea that we know that most people who come to edit Wikipedia, even those who aren't logged in, are probably trying to do the right thing. Now, that doesn't apply to everybody. You can't be naive about it. But in general, whereas 
most, uh, well, these days, most social media would give you the idea that the general public is full of angry idiots. Um, that's because the design of those systems actually brings out the worst and actually amplifies the worst voices. And instead, to say, you know what, actually, most people are decent. I mean, we know that. Look around the room. I'm sure, you know, probably 95% of you are perfectly nice people. 4% are kind of annoying, and um, you know, one-tenth of 1% 1 say so would be actually problematic people. In general, most people are very nice, and so that, that insight into human nature means, hey, we can all work together in a spirit of goodwill to try to solve a problem, um, and we can do it in a pretty decentralized way. Now, Wikipedia is not fully decentralized in, in lots of ways, and I think that's an interesting uh, part of it. I mean, our technology is not particularly decentralized for a lot of very good reasons. Uh, you know, it's, we have a database and we have uh, web servers and it's a centralized sort of hosting system, just like pretty much every major website. Uh, but the way the governance is done is decentralized and, and it's really decision-making spread very widely throughout the community. Yeah, and I mean, on that topic of governance, um, I. You know, one of the things that we do at the Filecoin Foundation is facilitate an open governance process. Um, and, you know, I've also heard it said that, you know, every war that has been fought has been refought on Wikipedia. <laughs> and I think for those of yeah. us who facilitate open governance, uh, that really uh, strikes a chord. Uh, and so I would really love, I think we can learn a lot from you and from Wikipedia about how open governance works. And this idea mm. that, well, it's actually not anarchy and there are systems you could in put in place to make sure that you have really effective community governance. So what could we learn from Wikipedia? I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the, the you know, key things about uh, Wikipedia is that distributed governance model. And there's a lot of different lessons that we can learn in a lot of different sort of distributed governance uh, situations. Um, you know, one of them is, you know, at Wikipedia, one of the things that we do is um, we don't have rigid votes on most things. Um, and there's a reason for that. So I'll just give a, an example that sort of helps to illustrate it. Is if, let's say we're, we're looking at which picture of the Eiffel Tower that we want to have in the lead space in the, our entry on the Eiffel Tower. And maybe there are two or three good candidates and different people think different ones are the better picture. And so how do we decide that? Well, we could have a really rigid voting mechanism, but um, that seems overkill, and it doesn't allow for um, sort of the informality and, and goodwill. But we will often have what we call a not vote. And so this is just a straw poll where somebody will say, well, look, you know, we've been arguing about this for three weeks. Uh, let's take a quick poll and see what people think. And if it turns out, gee, like 80% of the people in the discussion think picture A is better than picture B, then probably the people who are supporting picture B can go, all right, well, I'm clearly not in the right here. I'm going to drop it. And it's a consensus building mechanism as opposed to a rigid vote. Now, some things are more rigid votes, you know, sort of um, electing people to the arbitration committee or to the board of the Wikimedia Foundation. But that sort of casual approach to saying, look, we're a bunch of people, uh, you know, there's an old saying in open source, open source software of uh, rough consensus and running code is really, really important in, in our context as well. So it's, you know, there are a lot of lessons just in terms of not being too rigid, um, assuming good faith of other people, uh, but also being willing to have some specified procedures to come to a final decision. I mean, there are cases in Wikipedia where I think we currently have a problem. Uh, the problem is we have a, I'll give a very good example. Um, how do you become an admin in English Wikipedia? It's very, very hard to become an admin in English Wikipedia, probably harder than it should be. And I'd say if you polled our community, you have a very good consensus that we need to be making more people admins. The problem we have is of each of the proposed solutions, and there are many, none of them have consensus. So we're kind of stuck in this weird edge case. And at some point, somebody's gonna have to facilitate a process to say, you know what, we're actually just gonna have to have a vote we're going to have to eliminate some candidates kind of ruthlessly through a preliminary round of voting. We're going to actually make a decision and we're going to go for a majority because rough consensus isn't actually getting us to where we need to go. And so that kind of um, openness to really rethinking and thinking about how are you making decisions and so forth. Now, this, this works well uh, in some areas, but in other areas, it might be very, very difficult or very hard. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, when we look at in the cryptocurrency world, certain decisions that have been taken 
which I think were the right decisions. So I remember there was a case when there was a big Ethereum um, robbery fairly early on, and the decision was taken to sort of zero out those stolen tokens, um, which was done in kind of a brute force way, in a, in a possibly non-transparent way. It's probably the right decision, but it kind of highlights, actually that's really tricky because certainly you don't want to suddenly have a system where everybody votes as to whether to sort of cancel a bunch of people's tokens because that's not really defensible in the long run. So these things are complicated and, and really require a lot of reflection and thought and dialogue and debate. But again, coming back to that, if you have a community with values around assuming good faith, you have a good chance at coming to a decent decision. And so, you know, obviously you've scaled uh, in just an unimaginable way, and you certainly didn't start off with these systems and processes. So how did you go about um, sort of going from, from zero to scaling each of these processes? How did you make decisions about, um, about these processes along the way, and sort of what can we who are facilitating open source governance learn mm. from that? Well, so there's a few things. So uh, the first thing is always referring back to our core mission is really important. So the idea that Wikipedia is an encyclopedia, uh, that actually helps to clarify a lot of decision-making processes, uh, just as uh, you know, for Filecoin, uh, the values and the, and the thing you're trying to accomplish actually determines the shape of a lot of what you need to do. Uh, but then you also have to say, look, we, you, you can't anticipate every problem a priori. And in fact, it's probably not a good idea to try to because sometimes if you legislate in some really systematic way against something that was never gonna happen anyway, then you've made restrictions in the system that actually are kind of pointless. Like there's a great uh, Wikipedia page, you can find it under WP colon beans, uh, which says, we, we don't have a rule that says don't push beans up your nose because as soon as we made the rule, it might give somebody the idea. And so there's a lot of bad things. We can sit up here and, and dream up bad things people might do and yeah, we probably don't need to worry about it until it actually happens, but you need to be resilient when things do happen. And so for a lot of things, you know, like with, with Filecoin, you've got, uh, you know, all these nodes storing files, you've got a marketplace around that. There will be problems that come emerge five years from now as the system becomes really big and really important and a fundamental part of sort of the economics of how file storage is done, permanent file storage especially, that you haven't anticipated now. And that's okay, because if you tried to anticipate all the worst problems from day one, you would, you would possibly uh, get it wrong and you would sort of block actual innovation because you've made a bunch of rules instead of letting people innovate around them. Uh, but also, you might actually create a system that's too rigid to actually deal with the problems you didn't think of. And so suddenly you've got a new problem that you never considered and you've all tried to redo everything from the beginning and you'll never touch it again. And then it's kind of like, ooh, we're sort of stuck. I would actually argue um, Bitcoin has a huge environmental impact problem that is not likely to be solved anytime soon because there's not a good decision-making model around how to move Bitcoin from proof of work to proof of stake or something else. Uh, Ethereum has finally sort of getting there. Um, and, and that's partly because everything is so baked in from day one that it didn't leave room for a community or a sort of user base methodology for changing how Bitcoin works. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that's very sage advice for those of us who are working on these types of governance models. Um, one of the things that I've heard you talk about is the ways in which talent is distributed throughout society um, and uh, sort of how that's made Wikipedia into what it is. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I love talking about this. So, you know, one of the things that is very famous about Wikipedia is that everyone can come and contribute. Anybody can, you know, you can just rock up today. 99.9 .9 plus percent of pages are completely unlocked so that you can edit without even logging in. Uh, and that openness is pretty shocking, uh, certainly for people who come from old school academic encyclopedia worlds where you think, oh no, you've got to have a gatekeeper model where everybody's vetted in advance and you have to get the right professor who knows everything about this and that's who is the only person who could possibly write this entry. And we have a completely different approach and it's been incredibly productive and positive in lots of ways. I love to tell the story of uh, Kailana, 
Um, that's not her real name, that's her username. Uh, Emily is her real name. And Kailana is now a 28-year-old uh, physician. She's a medical doctor. Uh, but she started editing Wikipedia when she was 10. We didn't know she was 10. That's not technically in the rules, but you know, we didn't know it. Uh, she only edited a few times when she was 10. When she was 12, she got really active in the community. And when she was 13, she was elected as an administrator in English Wikipedia, which, as I've referenced, is really hard to do. And what she did, and only then did we begin, people started to realize and understand, oh gosh, she's like this very young teenager who's now an admin in English Wikipedia. But also, she started a campaign to improve the uh, biographies of female scientists, which is an interest of hers, foreshadowing that she'll become a medical doctor. Um, and there's been research showing the Kailana effect, like the impact she had was absolutely enormous, that there was a lot of neglect of female scientists, uh, there's a lot of work has been done, lots of community efforts and so on. Um, and it's made a dramatic impact on Wikipedia in, a way, in an area that's very, very important. And if you just think about, now you go back and you think about, imagine if you're the editor-in-chief of Britannica in 1975 and you think, gee, we know we've got this historical uh, inequity around uh, the encyclopedia's treatment of female scientists. We need to go back and address that you probably wouldn't have thought what we really need is a really enthusiastic 13-year-old girl. Like, that would have never occurred to anyone. But talent is widely distributed. In fact, they probably would have hired a bunch of old white men, you know, to solve the problem. Talent is widely distributed. And so having a culture and a system where you say, actually, what you bring to the table in terms of your talent and your intelligence is really important. And I like to tell that story because in the abstract, if I just said to you, gee, we have a lot of young people editing Wikipedia, and I think in society we should listen to young people. They have a lot to offer. Everybody go, oh, yes, young people have a lot to offer. But it kind of makes it real. Like, you can go, oh, right, like, I get it. Like, here's a young person who's done this amazing thing, had a huge impact on a community that matters, uh, and it's huge. And so that, that idea that talent can be everywhere, and of course, in the open source software world, uh, this, is, this is not unusual at all. Uh, you know, all kinds of people have done incredible work. Um, kind of unsung and some of them quite young uh, just because running code is running code. So, Is there anything that you think we can do to facilitate that or is that something that's just sort of a natural part of decentralized systems? It's sort of a natural part but it's also something you have to watch out for and you have to think about in your culture. Um, you have to sort of make sure to, to talk about it and to say look we actually want to be welcoming to talent. And so we don't make assumptions around men, women, young people, old people. We're looking for people who can help us solve the problems we have and do so in a positive and collaborative way. Uh, and if you don't talk about it, it's quite easy for people to stay stuck in some assumptions and to not think about these things and not to be offering that invitation. Uh, because the invitation really matters to people. If you, you know, if you seem to be a community that's not interested uh, in receiving outside input, and this isn't just about gender imbalance or age imbalance, this is about everything. If you have a vibe, we're not interested in outside input, okay, guess what? You're not gonna get any outside input. And that's gonna cause you a lot of uh, failures that you could have avoided had you realized, actually, we need to be open to new ideas always because there's, there's always the, the very strong potential that something new will be thought of by another human mind that is coming at the problem in a new way than we're sort of stuck in. So zooming out a little bigger picture, how are you thinking about sort of the decentralized systems you're seeing today uh, and sort of um, all of the decentralized technologies around the movement to build the decentralized web? I mean, it's fascinating. And, um, you know, a, a lot of what's going on, uh, I am a bit skeptical of a lot that's going on in the pure cryptocurrency world. Um, now that it's crashed quite a bit, um, then a certain part of that bubble is over, and I think that's okay. Um, but, I mean, one of the things that I do find very interesting, uh, and Filecoin's a good example, is something that starts not with, oh, here's this fancy new blockchain thing, and you can do a cryptocurrency, let's do that. But it's actually saying, actually, here's something very functional and useful. Decentralized, highly resilient storage that could potentially be done in a much cheaper way, without the reliance on any one organization, any one sort of server, farm, whatever, um, and sort of using this uh, crypto technology to facilitate that network. 
That's super interesting. Um, and one of the few things that I know of in this space that isn't sort of more hype than reality. Uh, and so, you know, I think what we will see in the future is strong resilience of things that are actually solving real problems and doing something practical, and eventually sort of the fading out of some of the hype and the fluff uh, that maybe was never going to go anywhere. I mean, it's, this is no different. I mean, it's nothing super shocking or different than I, I'm a veteran, I'm old now, you know, and so I'm a veteran of the dot-com boom and bust, uh, and there was a lot of stuff that was going on in that dot-com boom that was just bonkers, right? And you could look at it even then and say, gee, I don't think that's going to work, but the hype around it was so like, to the moon, you know, everything's great. Um, everybody will want to order dog food from pets.com, or um, I don't want to insult pets.com, I'm not sure if that's an actual story, but... Um, and then now, you know, eventually that settled out, the hype died, but actually the fundamentals, and actually e-commerce is a huge thing now, um, the fundamentals succeed in the long run. And so I, in this space of, of decentralized systems, decentralized communities, decentralized software, um, the, the way I look for winners is, is things that are actually solving real problems, uh, that are actually working towards functionality. Some of it can be a little broken for a while because that's the nature of innovation. Um, as opposed to just sort of purely speculative, um, you know, there's like a million sort of boringly identical altcoins that are sort of don't seem to be solving any problem that anybody has. And then there's other projects that are like, oh, I don't know if that's going to work, but that's interesting at least. And so that's, that's what I'm intrigued by. And you talked a little bit about this sort of idea behind resilience, which is really fundamentally at Filecoin Foundation what we're trying to do, which is build a more robust foundation for humanity's most important information. Could you talk a little bit about how you think about that resilience? Yeah, so, you know, when one of the things that makes Wikipedia resilient in a big picture, sort of step back a very long way, is the fact that it's all freely licensed. And so, that's really important because it means that uh, one potential single point of failure would be the Wikimedia Foundation. So the, the organization that operates the Wikipedia website and all of that. But if the Wikimedia Foundation um, you know, were to go bankrupt, not likely, we're doing well financially, or to go crazy, also not likely, but and certainly as long as I'm around to fight it, we're gonna be like very s sort of boringly sane. Um, then there is always an escape hatch. If, if people don't like the direction that Wikipedia is going in, like let's say Wikipedia, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation decided to announce that uh, we've decided that this whole neutrality thing is nonsense, we're gonna now become uh, the Trump encyclopedia or Wikipedia. we always already get called that by right-wing media, but uh, then people could just fork. They could just go, no, I don't really want a Trump encyclopedia, I don't want Wikipedia. I want a neutral, fair, balanced, in-depth look at facts of reality then people could fork and leave, and that's one of our pieces of resilience. Obviously, as an organization, there's all kinds of different points and places where you can think about, um, you know, what are the points of failure? How might we, uh, you know, ameliorate those and, and deal with those? Uh, and w one of them is, uh, is decentralization, is an incredibly powerful tool uh, for, for that. So, um, you know, as I say, like, Wikipedia being freely licensed means there are backups everywhere, and I, I, you just told me earlier that there, somebody is storing all of Wikipedia on IPFS. I didn't know that. I'm not sure that's anything we officially did or not, but somebody did it, and that's great, because it's all out there. It's all free, and like people can do interesting stuff. Yeah, and, and speaking of that, you know, one of the things that we've repeatedly seen is authoritarian governments blocking Wikipedia. Um, and in some cases, we've seen decentralized systems being used to sort of circumvent those blocks to actually access Wikipedia. Um, so I guess, how do you think about decentralized systems as it relates to that, to that censorship resistance? Well, I mean, it, it's clearly incredibly important. Uh, so censorship circumvention software is a human right. Uh, I do regard this as a fundamental issue of human rights. Um, with Wikipedia, we are currently blocked only in China, uh, as far as I know. Um, somebody said, are you blocked in North Korea? I said, no, the only guy with a computer can look at whatever he wants, but, uh, but we're blocked in, in China, but we're not blocked in Turkey, and we were. And so what happened in Turkey, and this is actually sort of one of the reasons that a semi-decentralized, semi-centralized system can be very powerful is that there, there, it wasn't just sort of an, a, a vague, amorphous collective that nobody could fight. 
the Wikimedia Foundation fought uh, against the bloc in Turkey. We went to court, uh, we, we lost in court, we lost in appeals court, we went to the Supreme Court in Turkey and we were about to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights because Turkey is a signatory to that. Uh, but we won in Turkish Supreme Court and the block was overturned, which is a major blow for freedom of expression in Turkey. Uh, and so we were back on. So that was our sort of old fashioned cent centralized, you know, like we paid lawyers and we fought in courts, great. Um, but also at the same time, there was a lot of decentralized stuff going on uh, where people were using circumvention software or setting up um, unofficial mirrors or proxies and things like that. I mean, I, I went to Turkey and a lot of people, I, you know, I said, oh, well, you know, how about the block? And like, oh, everybody in Turkey knows you just add a zero on the, you know, it was a, a different domain name uh, that was not set up with our authorization, but it got popular because everybody loves Wikipedia and they're just like, oh, all you have to do is just do this and you can get on again. Uh, and so that kind of informal resilience um, is decentralized, right? It's just some random person is like, oh, I, I have this idea for how to get around it. Uh, at the same time, I think, you know, uh, politically, I'm a very strong proponent of freedom of expression. Uh, we do have to fight it in, in the old fashioned way. We can't just go, oh no, decentralized systems will take care of everything because oftentimes they're hard to use. They're, they're not what people are expecting. Um, and in many places, <clears throat> um, in China, for example, <clears throat> loads and loads of tech people um, use VPNs. <clears throat> they use it for other reasons, for work or whatever, but they use VPNs to get around the block and they can get on Wikipedia. So for them, it's no big deal. But the government knows that and what they're really after is a chilling effect. They aren't really trying to say nobody should look at Wikipedia. They're really signaling there are certain issues that you don't talk about on the domestic Chinese websites and we signal that by blocking things we don't like. Um, so we have to fight it politically, but we also, circumvention is important. So my last question, very briefly, is um, what's your vision for the future of the internet? My vision for the future of the internet? Well, I, I always joke, um, I'm, I'm a carpenter, not an architect. Uh, what I mean is, I, I like building things, um, but I do have some sort of bigger, grander ideas. I mean, the current thing that I'm working on a lot uh, is uh, an alternative to Twitter, an alternative to Facebook, which I think we desperately need. It's called Wiki Tribune Social, wt.social for a short domain name. And the idea is to basically build a social network that doesn't prioritize content based on clicks, likes, retweets, engagement metrics, which are generally about promoting the worst possible content because it pisses people off and they have to respond to it. Uh, but instead, quality content as chosen by the most trusted people in the community. Uh, will it work? I don't know, but I'm having fun working on it. Um, we're going to roll out a new version of the software in the next couple months, uh, which actively implements a trust metric where people can actually assign ratings of trust and so on. I've got a whole algorithm I've worked out for that. Uh, and it's going to be a learning process. But for me, uh, you know, the business model of what I'm working on is uh, no ads, no paywall, uh, terrible business model, but that's how I've built my career so far. Um, and, you know, the idea is to say, let's try to do it a different way because uh, I don't know what you think. I don't think Elon is going to be the right person to turn Twitter into a thoughtful, reflective place where we can have serious and meaningful dialogue about the future of the planet. I think he's going to let a lot of horrible people back on and create more and more anger and fighting. Uh, I think it's a big mistake, and so I think it's time to leave. So, well, come and join me. Come and help me. Great. Well, we're. I'm. It's <laughs> such a delight to get to hear you know that message about building a better internet, and it's wonderful to hear that you're still actively involved in doing that. Um, this has been a phenomenal conversation, Jimmy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Good to be here. Thank you.